Hello, and welcome to Clamp, the Creating, Living, and Making podcast. I'm your host, Morley Kurt, and joining me as always is Grant Alexander. Hello. And Adam Mackey. Hello. What's up this, guys? Whoa, that's not a sentence. What's up this week, guys? <laughs> uh, what is in your clamps, Adam? Uh, uh, I've just been working on my workbench, actually. I got um, five drawers built this morning before we started recording this. And um, I've got another five to go. Pretty over making drawers, to be honest. <laughs> and then um, I've still got to do the drawer runners and the drawer fronts and the um, inset drawer pulls and everything. Yeah, well, a, lot of, a lot of repetitive work. And then paint everything. Fun. Dang. Uh, what about you, Grant? What have you been up to this week? Well, um, I wasn't ready. I just looked at our notes and I was third on the list, but apparently I'm going to go now. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I And I just saw Morley put himself in second, so I was all braced for going last. And it was a triple, a segue. triple goof. Yeah. Uh, but I have been working on... Uh, well, one thing I did this week is I, I shot a short interview with uh, another channel, and it's going to be out in May. It's the Make or Break channel, um, and uh, I'll talk about it more closer to the release date, um, but I wanted that's what I've been working on. I kind of set up to try and minimize some echoing in my uh, garage. I set up some blankets uh, hanging from the, the garage door and set up my ring light and everything, tried to make it a really good looking thing. Hopefully it turned out and hopefully the, the audio is up to snuff. Um, I don't know. Some people are very picky about audio, so we'll see. Um, yeah. Very nice. And then, yeah. The other thing is I, uh, I was fixing a little toy car again because of course, instead of uh, replacing the super glue on both sides, I only replaced the super glue on the one side that broke <laughs> off. So now the other side broke off. And yeah, that's that's what I've been up to. Nice. Um, well, apologies for mixing up every all the order. Um, our patrons would know that I'm a little frazzled right now uh, because Eden and I just got back from visiting her newborn nephew. Her brother and his wife just had their baby uh four or five days ago. So we just got to go see him for the first time from the other side of a glass door, but it was still um, very exciting. But other than the excitement of a new little human, we, or I, um, I made a little project for Penny. Um, we have a decommissioned fireplace in our apartment, which is a pretty common occurrence in uh, Toronto and Montreal. And I think in a lot of other cities in general um, with air quality regulations. Um, they're outlawing the use of fireplaces in cities. So a lot of these old buildings, like the one that I live in, have fireplaces that you can't use anymore. I mean, ours literally has carpet going into it and it's all painted inside and the <laughs> flue is all sealed shut. Um, so it's this kind of like awkward little space um, that is really ripe for doing something with. So I basically built this plywood insert that has like tiered shelves on it that I covered with carpet for uh to make a little nook for penny and with a little bit of catnip she loves it um she actually went up and explored it before i put the catnip on but that was like at 10 p.m at night so it didn't make for fantastic filming so to get the bit for the video i had to do a little bit of luring um it was just like a really fun uh quick little project it was nice to uh do some woodworking after I've been working on the computer a bunch, uh, for various things. Um, yeah, it was a nice, nice quick project. It was really cool to see how much you've expanded your, even if like, I know you're working in the little garage there that you may not always be able to work in, but how quickly you were like taking over spaces yeah. in this new place. It was a uh, really fun to kind of see, you know, it's interesting to see you like expanding your workspace and I, I can just see so many possibilities now with what you can do. Yeah. I guess this was the first one where you actually see the, the first video where you see the inside of this uh, workshop. Cause I didn't really do anything in here for the bed drawers. Um, yeah. I'm i uh, I'm pretty quick to move into a new spot and start using things. 
as I think a lot of us are who do the makery things. Um, I meant yeah. to watch the video before we started, but then I got distracted playing Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I was like, I was like, I got to spare 40, 40 minutes. Yeah. So in my, uh, since I ruined Grant's fabulous segue in my, uh, in my post baby frenzy, uh, I guess I'll just do a really, uh, stilted one. Um, I had a topic for this week that I thought would be really interesting to talk about. Um, something that I've come to recognize is that I can build a lot of barriers for myself, even when I'm not thinking I am. Sometimes I look up one day and I'm like, wait a second, I thought I couldn't do this thing. But all the reasons that I couldn't do it were just these like little self-imposed barriers that I just put up because of some fallacy that I built in my head. Um, I mean, it's a long-winded way of saying getting out of your own way. Like when you figure out how to do that, um, I feel like it really just blows your world wide open. And I thought it'd be a really cool thing to talk about because I think we all have experience doing that um, in little things and in big things and in projects in our lives. Have you guys uh, had any experiences with that recently? Well, I would say that I've been experiencing that a lot recently. If anything, I'd say that one of the biggest barriers that I find myself doing is that I I say to myself, I only have 10 minutes. So instead of going and doing something productive, I'm like, I'll just go on Instagram for 10 minutes. I'll go watch a 10-minute YouTube video, which really means scrolling through YouTube and not finding a video that's the right amount of time and <laughs> and then like, oh, they're all 12 minute videos. Oh, I'm 12 minutes. Oh no. And uh, yeah. So what the b- barrier I build for myself is going is, is not realizing how much I can get done in, in a small amount of small chunks of time. Um, like I will, I do that. I, all I, the time. We, yeah, we started a little bit late today. Um, and so we had an extra 30 minutes between when we normally start and, uh, when we started the podcast this evening and I decided to fill that time with a little bit of work. That's when I was fixing the car. I also fixed one of uh, my dining room chairs, which just like, you know, poured some glue in a crack and clamped it back together. Um, But I think one of the big things for me is, is, is going, I don't have time to do that thing and not realizing how much time I waste. And I know it's, it harkens back to my, New Year's resolution of trying to be more intentional with my time. But I think I need to kind of amend that and think about it more as um, like try and be if you can be productive, like because I'll just give myself a pass too often is basically what's end up happening. I'm just saying, don't worry, you can be you can you can waste those 10 minutes. Don't worry, it's just 10 minutes, right? But in the past, I was using them. And now I don't know. I'm not. So Yeah. I, I think it's really easy um, to kind of like trivialize things that seem simple being like, oh, well, this th- that task will take me no time at all. So I don't need to do it now. Let me focus on like these other things that are going to take more time and energy and effort. And then you've put off all like a million things that are all simple, but cumulatively, then you've built this mountain of procrastination. <laughs> yeah. I think it's funny that you talked about building barriers and I I think about it like it's really funny that makers are still building even when they're not doing something. We're we're building barriers to doing things. I just think it's a really funny like turn of expression to go with what we like to do. Yeah. And I mean, again, uh, it plays into what we were talking about the pre-show. It's like rather than a, finish a canoe that you might want to start building you just designing a complicated winch system so you can pull it out of the way and take even longer to finish it it's like i mean it's a it's a curse with creative people it's like you find every excuse not to do the work until at a certain point um you just have no choice but to do it i can't remember who i was listening to who said that sorry penny's trying to dig something out of a crevice um I think it was Seth Godin on the Tim Ferriss podcast um, or someone similar who was saying it's like you spend like an eight hour work day doing everything except for the thing you're trying to do. And then you spend the last hour in like a mad rush 
kind of getting it all done sometimes. And I don't know, it's like maybe those maybe those eight hours of random things would never get done if you weren't putting off the thing you were really wanted to do all along. You know, uh, productive procrastination. I, I wish For, I could be more productive with my pr- procrastination. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. As I said, I could have watched your video, but I played Fortnite. You, you, doubled, I, no, I'm the same. you doubled in yeah. pr- produce. You didn't even do the, exactly. the non-productive watching a video. You went, I'm going to even not do that tiny amount of yeah. productivity. <laughs> but even um, so this morning I, I went out and I was cutting up all the bottoms of all the drawers that I'm making it and all that sort of stuff. And I looked at the clock and I'm like, it's been like 40 minutes. But if I was, if I had an hour to do something, I'd go, oh no, I don't have time to do that. Like hundred percent. Totally. Like, Crazy. Well, it's it's so funny, like how time works with productivity. It's like an hour can feel super short, but then you're like amazed at how much you can get done in thirty minutes. Mm. Um, it's, <laughs> I think it's it's it really comes down to like how much you're dreading doing the task, and it's so weird, like when you're dreading to do something. It's like the second you start doing it, I don't know if you guys experience it, but it's like the dread just disappears. I feel like there's this like there's this curve that increases in slope, which is the amount of dread over time as you approach something. And then the second you start doing it, it just drops off to zero. You're like, oh, this is all it takes. That was actually a big watershed moment for me in university where it was like, I think when I got to university, I was I was really nervous of like how difficult it would be in comparison to high school. Cause I liked, I did really well in high school. And I think I was feeling like a little bit of like trepidation of like, oh, am I gonna, not be as good of a student anymore. Um, And then I I built this good habit early on of just like not putting stuff off and starting. And it was just so helpful of terms of like, yeah, if you just like do the work, it sounds simple, but like just doing it at a certain point uh, can take you pretty far. I was going (laughs) to say I had the complete opposite. I was doing really well in high school. And I did the opposite when I went to university because I didn't do the work because I was so used to, to floating by in university and like being able to do like, Oh, your homework's due in five minutes oh, do it really quick. Right. Like save it all for, and then you, when you get to university, depending on what you're taking, I went, you know, me and Marley were both went for engineering. Um, he graduated. I didn't, uh, it's probably the difference in the, in the path that we're just talking about now is I would always like humans are really bad at estimating how long something is actually going to take based off past experience. And they're also really bad at, at estimating how much time they can save by doing X, Y, or Z. Like that's why people always think that they'll save so much more time by speeding when they don't. Um, Proven. Yeah, so yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's it is proven, but um, I know, I'm joking. It's I, I I still I know the the information is out there, and I still speed, so I don't go. I don't know why. I could tell myself, no, nah, but this it doesn't apply to me today. That's why, right. I'll get there faster. Don't worry. I'll get there I, I'll mathematically be like- faster than I can. I'll be at work thinking about like going home and I'm like, I'm going to sit on the speed limit the whole way home. I have no reason to speed. And next thing I know, I'm like sitting up someone's butt going a hundred and fucking. Yeah. Um, I think it's, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a little funny and ironic that like I'm the whole point of me making the one hour builds when I did was to show people that you can make so much in an hour, but then I still tell myself that I can't make anything in an hour. Like, that's why I loved those, that, the, that barrier or that, that, yeah. the, 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 the thought process behind that. Yeah. Um, I definitely got to bring him back. So outside of time, was there something else? Cause we've kind of gone down time a lot and I kind of, I think yeah. there must be, there's other barriers I'm sure. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, making out of a small space, like I have to deal with barriers pretty constantly. Like most of my making is, is figuring out ways to overcome barriers. It's like I was on a uh, clubhouse a bit, the last couple of days, um, there's been like a ton of makers that have been joining it. And so like, there's been a lot more makery conversations, which are really fun. And it's like, a lot of times I find it like difficult to relate to people. Cause they're talking about like how to like set up your table saw and like 
in feed and out feed. I'm like, I don't like, those aren't even things I, I care about because <laughs> a table saw, I'm not going to get a table saw. Um, but with like making in a small space, I still find that I build barriers to myself within that, even though it feels like I'm, I'm overcoming them in every project. And it's like, I think sometimes you find yourself in a rut and you don't realize that like everything has changed. It's like moving into this new place. Like I think in some ways I'm still operating like I was in my old apartment where my workspace was a corner of our living room and I had no outdoor space. And now like it's really nice having all of this space, but I haven't really fully blown open the possibilities of having access to the outdoors and having a separated room. Like that, it really changes a lot more than I think I realized earlier. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm trying not to like just be the same, but in a larger space, but you know, kind of fully take advantage of it. So I think, I think in trying to get out of your own way, it's also important to like ask yourself questions and to avoid complacency. Um, so you don't look I, up one day and you're like, wait, I'm not. Yeah. What were you going to say, Grant? I, I think a lot of people get trapped in that because they get, they, they, they set up their workshop and then they'll never change it. And they'll work around like having to step around 15 different things and step over a bunch of like extension cords. And they're like, well, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Right. And this isn't like a, a like Ja Rule song. This is like real life. So. <laughs> uh, you know, that's not just the way it is. You can change stuff. And I think like, that's a lot of times like I, you, you can take a step back and try and become like a barrier. People often like talk about that. I think, you know, it's similar to you. It's like the small workplace or whatever your workplace doesn't work for that thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like, but it can. Right, you can you can if you need to. Mm-hmm. Right, like I think about Al's Hack Shack building the the big F table. Um, the table he built was bigger than his shed, so he built an extension on his shed, right, a temporary extension on his shed, so that he could build this table. It's yeah. like you can do it if you want to. If it's you all ev- about- if if you ever need inspiration for working with limited tools in a small space. Just watch videos of people making things in developing countries. Totally. Like those are so inspired. Like primitive technology is one thing, but people like wrecked. I I saw this video on TikTok of a guy got like a wrecked semi truck and with like a a, a MIG welder and mallet and like Bondo and just pure elbow grease. He like refurbished it to new. And that's like one of the things I really enjoy about traveling. I think like living in the country that you grew up in, you, you so take for granted the way that things are done. But when you go to a different country, especially if it's like not close to where you are, like if it's a very different culturally, um, you realize that like so many of the way that we do things are just because that's how it's evolved, not because it's necessarily like the best way of doing it. Um, like people right. really and, make and do with the, anything. It's exactly what I was going to say. People will make with like on their lap. That's the only spot they have. Right. Like, so then they develop a system where they like a Swedish lap vice is a great uh, tool. That's like that. It's, it's a little vice that you control with your feet for, for doing wood carving and it's like spoon carving. Um, it's like one of those things you just go like, if you, if the will is there, you can do it. And so I think if you're coming up with barriers, I think really you need to look inside you to figure out whether or not the barrier is external or not. Because I think a lot of times when you're coming up with barriers that are stopping you, it's probably because you don't want to do that thing anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. And I think I think as well like just the literally the opposite of what you just said, having less introspection can sometimes be a really good way of getting rid of those barriers because sometimes we spend so much time thinking about like 
what do we want to do and how do we want to come across and like, you know, like what type of, you know, like what is this, what is this all moving towards that you get sort of too caught up in it and you don't let yourself just like try something different or just switch it up a little bit or make it more fun. I found that sort of way of thinking very helpful in my videos. If I'm like, if sometimes I realize like, this is actually a good question to uh, one of the Q and a questions that Justin Ofler submitted, which is like, I've already made this video and I'm not excited about it. Like, what are some things you can do to make it more exciting? Just like add more exciting music, like do something fun with the edit. I kind of tried that in my more recent video. Like I found this, I found this like really sort of fun trap hip hop song uh, that was a good bit more intense than like other songs I've used. And I was like, I can make this more fun. Like there's no reason not to. Um, it, it's a funny, like, totally. it, again, it kind of comes out into getting out of your habits and just having that sort of beginner mindset. So you're okay with changing it up. And I think really so many things come down to just like keeping that beginner mindset. Like people say it all the time. Like the longer you do something, the harder it becomes because you learn more and you have higher standards and just everything, everything starts working against you a little bit and keeping it fun and fresh, um, is, is really the way to go and, and making people a little annoyed who might watch your stuff and be like, well, now it's different. It's like, well, people change (laughs) and it's good. It's good for people to change. I think one of the, one of the biggest things I do is I try to make things more difficult than they need to be. Um, so for my drawers, for my workbench, I want to make sure I wanted to make sure that I didn't have, um, like handles that stick out. I wanted them to be flush with the front front of all the drawers so I don't get caught on them and all that sort of stuff. And then, and then I started looking up inset drawer pulls and I'm like, they're like $10 each. Like that's a hundred bucks for my workbench. Like that's so much money. And then I'm thinking, how can I make them myself? And like trying to make it so much more difficult than I thought. And then I thought, you know what, why don't I just get a router bit, which is like an upside down triangle and just route out a rectangle so that it, so that it's sort of like a rectangle that then goes in like a, triangle underneath so it's like wider inside well first my thought was to use like a t-track bit but then i used the route the the triangle bit and it's just so simple and easy and like pretty much free to make Mm -hmm. yeah did you wait first did you see my uh bed drawers video because that's kind of what i did just like an integrated beveled drawer pull no i didn't i haven't watched that one yet okay that might make it even simpler because i think what i did was even simpler than what you're thinking of although it's very similar yeah right um, yeah, I, I think that is a, a like a fantastic point. Um, I think like the solution is usually right there. And I think we tend to overthink it way more than it needs to. And I've, I, I've, I think I've gotten a good bit better at recognizing that. Like I'm working on a, designing a new project right now. And um, it's kind of like, I kind of want to fasten it to the wall and hang it from the ceiling Um, and there's a sort of like weird jigging up that needs to happen. So I found myself just like staring at it a lot, but also just doing my day and thinking around and thinking about other things at the same time. So I'm not just focusing so hard about it because I know it's one of the things where it's like the solution is way simpler than I think. And I just need the space and the time to allow it to come for me. It's going to sound a little hokey, but like I've been meditating a good bit recently. And one of the things that I found And doing that and being able to clear my head and, you know, like find the moments of quiet is that it, it, it does allow those like more obvious solutions to come a little easier because they, they usually are right there. You just have to kind of allow them to come in. Totally. Yeah. I've heard, um, I've heard a lot of people talk about meditation lately, actually. I was just saying, yeah, I've heard a lot of people talk about like the benefits of meditation and stuff lately. I think just getting out of your own mind and just trying not to think about anything. Well, not think about anything, but you know, like, I don't know. My mind's just going a hundred miles per hour, 24 yeah. seven. So and- I'm trying to just slow that down and, and not think properly. I mean, we have so many inputs in our life, right? 
It's like, think, yeah. if you think about how many like maker videos and things you see throughout your day, it's like, I must have seen something that's going to give me a solution to this problem. And sometimes you need to just like stop and live in the moment and try to quiet everything down to yeah. allow them to come to you. And it's kind of funny. Like I found it can be a little counterproductive sometimes trying to meditate and then you realize something as you're meditating and then you get excited about it and you're like, oh, no, I want to go do that thing, but I'm just getting into a good state. So I, I think uh, a really good tip I heard about meditation is like a very a central part of it is the getting distracted and then coming back. And you shouldn't feel like that's incorrect, but that is just part of it. It's like you're constantly just pulling back to the now. Um, it's it's cool. Like I think there's a lot of benefits – um, I think it's, it's worth trying. It's, it's an interesting experience for sure. Totally. Definitely. Well, and thinking about the kind of getting distracted and coming back a lot of times I will get distracted cleaning my shop because I'm <laughs> like, I'll walk in and I'll be like, Oh, I didn't clean up the last time. And it's like, I only have X amount of time to do something or whatever. And I'll just like get distracted cleaning my shop. And then an hour later, I've taken apart my bandsaw to clean the like sawdust from the inside. I'm like, why am I doing this? I didn't, I came out here to like, like actually get something done. And instead I've spent an hour like deep cleaning something for no good reason. Um, and I think well, it's one of the things. opposite. <laughs> I go out intentionally to clean because I know I left it a mess. And next thing I know, I'm building a cabinet to store something that I didn't have storage for before. Well, that's cleaning, though. That's going to yeah. be cleaner when you leave it. Um, True. But what, like, yeah, I don't know. That's something that I have a problem with. But, I mean, for both of you, like, those might be things that you would never do unless, like, you came about it in that weird way. Maybe. You know? I don't know. Yeah, I seem maybe. to be like taken apart. I seem to clean more often than than I I work. It feels like I don't know. <laughs> I, I should clean, clean about the right amount. Yeah. yeah, I've been trying to get better about it, especially since we had that episode about like optimizing your space and having a clean slate to work from. I'm just like, maybe this is a barrier I'm building for myself. Like I've kind of resigned myself that I'm a messy desk person. If I could turn my laptop around and show you my desk right now like it's an it's a nightmare like everything's spread out um and i really have to make a conscious effort to clear it off and i've been trying to do that after projects because without fail whenever i publish a video i get this like it's like i've just like run a marathon and i need like a day to recover <laughs> and so I've, I've tried to take advantage of that time and clean a bit try to clear things off, address sort of like non-optimal shop things that I have don't usually think about. Um, it's still a mess, but it's getting there. Um, yeah, but I don't think I would do those things if I didn't make that time for it in the, in the lulls. Right. And I think part of getting out of your own way is realizing whether or not that actually uh, like affects your ability to be creative and do things, right? So having a clean shop might be the thing that helps you to create. It might also be the thing that hinders you, right? Because it doesn't actually, uh, it doesn't actually stop whether or not you, like having your, your desk being messy at the end of a project hasn't ever stopped you from starting a new project. Yeah, I mean it kind of has. Like I think I think in the process of cleaning my desk I've gotten more excited about things and gotten ideas. That's sort of like meditative menial task. Right. And I think I think sometimes I don't allow myself to think about larger projects if everything is an absolute mess and I don't have like the space to think. But has that ever stopped like if anything, the cleaning gets you going. Yeah, you know for sure. I mean? So like leaving it a mess, that's okay. If you are the type of person who's like takes out a tool, uses it once, puts it back, right? So that there's never a mess happening. Um, 
then I think you would probably realize that like whatever your thought process may not work the same way. Um, yeah. I, I think one of the things that I think about a lot when I think about the barriers I build in my shop are, are things that people talk about. Like I hear a lot of people talk about shopsmiths are, are horrible because you have to change the like motor to get the next one. Like there's a lot of setup time between going from a drill press to a, a lathe to a table saw to a whatever, right? Cause it's a multifunction tool. And I always think about that and I go, you know, there might be some time loss there. Right. And that is a barrier, but you have to, if you want to get that thing done and that's the tool you have, it doesn't, it's never a barrier to you. The, the barrier comes about is when you're trying to like, if you want to do production work, having everything set up optimally is best. But if you're just wanting to be creative and make something fun, right? The, the amount of time you think you give to that is probably way more than the amount of time it really should be. Hmm. I don't know. That, that's, well, that, on that is like one of the reasons why I hate that my shop doesn't have a place for everything and, and all that sort of stuff. I'm always trying to move stuff out of the way so that I can use a tool which then cuts down on productivity, but then not just that. I'm also trying to move stuff out of the way so they're not in frame. Whereas I'd probably just sketchily use the tool if it wasn't being recorded. <laughs> it's, but that's a barrier you, you've built for yourself. And yeah, for whether sure. or not it, like obviously having a, a perfect setup shop would be ideal. And there's no, I, I agree. It would be best to have every table. I'd like to have two table saws. I'd like to have seven table saws. And everyone has a different size blade on it. You know what I mean? Like, I'd love to have blade. a saw that always cuts straight. And yeah. 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 <laughs> a rip blade, a cross cut blade in 15 different dados would be perfect. <laughs> right. Like, of course, but that's like a ridiculous thing. But if you, like, like, I used to worry so much about changing the my saw blade when I needed to go from like the flat tooth grind to the, to the like normal, like glue line rip blade. And then I just went, you know what? It's literally like 13 seconds. Stop mm. worrying about it. You spent more time worrying about it than it took to do the thing. Just do yeah. the thing. That right there, I think is a great point. Um, once you stop just worrying about it, um, the the amount of time it takes to actually do the thing is a fraction, even if you're not set up perfectly. Like I have I have two batteries and I have four cordless tools. So I'm constantly like switching batteries and it like it seems like it's this little barrier. But once I start going, like I can switch out barriers like batteries like I'm a gunslinger. Like it's all good right. in the end. You know, <laughs> like y you you can humans are so adaptable. Like once you find yourself in any situation, you start messing around a little bit. Like it's all good. You can, you can switch things up. You can change bits pretty quickly. I remember when I first got a battery. Like back in the day, battery powered drills did not last as long. And I remember no, they were rubbish. They were they were complete rubbish. And I remember thinking, why would anyone ever do this when you could just plug Same. it into a wall, right? and it would go forever, right? Yep. And now there is nothing that would get me doing using a corded drill unless that was the only thing that was available. Mm. I think I'd rather use a like a hand powered cranky drill than a <laughs> than a the corded drill because it's at least cordless. <laughs> the only corded like hand tool that I use is a circular saw. And that's only because my um my Ryobi. battery powered circular saw was was oh. pretty rubbish, but I don't think there was anything actually wrong with the saw. I think I just needed a new blade, but I told myself there was something wrong with the saw, so I just bought a new saw and haven't had issues with the one I have. So I also was trying to cut down pallets, so that probably didn't help. But, yeah, I think another on the topic of like getting out of your own way. This is something I've like really grown with. In, um, in making videos and mostly in the f uh, areas of recording voiceover and recording on-camera stuff. Like 
I post it to my stories. There have been times where it's taking me like 40 takes to get a cut right or to get a, like to get a little segment, right? Like no lie. It'll take, sometimes it takes that long. And sometimes it's, sometimes a take is like two seconds of saying like, and once that was done and then, but I say those four words, I'm like, well, those four words don't sound right. I need like a different transition or this isn't what I want to say. Like this is too, this is too just like telling and not showing. And so sometimes I need to just workshop my way through it and it takes those 40 takes, but sometimes it is literally just, I am working myself into a ball of frustration and I need to stop, stand up, do something else. And just sometimes I just need to come at it tomorrow. And yeah. I think mm-hmm. recognizing those times is really beneficial. And you know, it's funny. It's like, I think the, the, the more times I stand up and just leave it and come back, like the less I have to do that in the future. Um, because you start sort of like, getting better at being a little more chill about it. And sometimes if you're, if you're really like frustrated and kind of tense about something, the more you do it, just the worse it's going to get. And I mean, that's the definition of getting out of your own way is literally knowing when to like stand up and say like, Nope, this isn't right. And that's something I've, I, I see anyone who has experienced in their space. They know when to do that. Like I noticed that when I was working at the set shop, If something, if an operation didn't feel safe, it didn't feel right, like the carpenters would know it's like, nope, we got to stop. We got to step back and reevaluate. And it's really important to recognize that when you're like zeroed in, but you shouldn't be zeroed in. You need to take a step back and kind of. Or else you cut off your pinky finger or something. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And you realize that there's nothing supporting that ladder. I was the same when I started trying to learn fusion as well. Like I'd be halfway through a project and get frustrated with things not going the way I wanted it to. So I'll just stop and come back at it the next day. It's one of like the most magical things in life. The fact that sometimes stopping something for a week, you can come back at it better than if you had spent a week working on it. Yeah, for sure. I it I that happened to me uh, in high school when I was pole vaulting. Like when I was going through one of my biggest growth phases, I went on vacation for a week, and my coach was like, "Wow, you should take a week off more often." <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually no on that. I'd say I've done the same thing. Like I've been going to the gym for, geez, almost two years straight, every single day now, and. Um, and yeah, I took a week off and I came back feeling so much better. Able to do more, had more flexibility. I'm now thinking I need another week off because I feel like crap again. But yeah, my I old age is really catching up with me. I need the rest of my life off. <laughs> you know, I think it's one of the problems with both our culture and us as humans is like we feel like we need to be busy. And sometimes like being busy won't cause you the most progress. It's kind of like the 80 20 principle. Like, if you take a step and look back, it's like, was spending those 50 hours during the week really as beneficial as like the three hours you spent doing that, like one particular thing that just like changed everything else? Obviously, identifying those things is incredibly difficult, but just being busy sometimes, like, is not the answer. Like, rest is really good. And um, Mm -hmm. sometimes allowing yourself to just wait a little bit or take a moment if it's not feeling right is like really the thing to do to get out of your own way. Hmm. Totally. One last thing I'll talk about is that I find is that often I'll say I don't have that tool. When I don't have that tool, I go, I can't do that thing. You're one of those people. So yeah, if I had $10,000 worth of tools, I could build that too. Well, no, I've never actually said that because I. But there's some things like I don't have a welder, so I can't weld. Yeah, right? it's a big different. Sure. Like there's a bigger like I I see someone doing something on a CNC and say, I'm pretty sure I could have done that on my jigsaw. Why do you use that stupid tool to do that thing? Mm. Right? It took you like more time programming the file. If you were going to make something once, it can take you more time to program the file than to cut it out with a bandsaw or a CNC. Right? What's on, on that, I was listening to 
was it either last week's or the week before's episode of making it and jimmy was talking about a guy the guy that runs the table legs website whatever it is yeah and he they don't use cnc because it takes too long yeah well, yeah, because they basically just have leg profiles cut into high speed steel, and yeah, yeah, just, yeah. but they they just pull the yeah. entire leg profile in one pull, uh, mm. and they've been doing that. It's the same with a molder or a shaper, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's the same sort of thing, just bigger because it's table legs. Yeah, but there are a lot of people who go, I can't do something round because I don't have a lathe. Right, and if you watch my last mm. video, I chucked something up in my drill press to do a little sanding. Like you, I know a drill press isn't great for doing lathe work, and I didn't do a real lathe work on it, but I made circular things using my drill press. I've seen yeah. people make pens on on drill presses. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, like a sideway lathe. Yeah, the the problem with it is the way the chuck interacts with it. It's not safe. It's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the problem is you can actually just have your chuck pop out while you're doing it. Yeah, and then you just wreck your piece. You wreck yourself, and yeah, you just need to, to know to your limits yourself before you wreck yourself. Yeah. Um. So I think when you don't have a tool, the first thing you shouldn't go is I don't have that tool. You should think. What tools do I have that could do that thing? Mm. Yeah. And that's that's one of the reasons like I'm so inspired by Jimmy DeResta videos is like, yeah, he has a ton of tools, but he'll do the same thing like 50 different ways across his videos. Mm. He'll just do like whatever he's like feeling right now or what tool makes sense or the tool he really likes. It's almost like his abundance of tools is inspirational for someone who doesn't have any tools because you just see so many ways of doing one thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like his little cutting board video that he did recently. The Easily dished one? Yeah, the dished one. It's like there are a hundred different ways you could have done that that didn't involve the the way he did it with the you know spinning. Like he could have just chucked it up in a lathe and boom, it would have been done. He could have thrown it on the CNC and he could have done it. You know, like there's – but he just wanted to do it a different way. Yeah. I think I that's think, what I think made a lot that of, really um, interesting. I think a lot of people like don't – Care. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to say this or like put people down, but like people are lazy and don't want to look into the ways of doing things. Like you watch someone build a table with dominoes and go, "Oh, I can't do that. I don't have a domino." Yeah, but you have. You could do dows, but they're too lazy to look up that a dowel is the same thing as a domino. But uh, just to put it in there, I know I'm facing that barrier right now. When it comes, like, I, I give myself that problem all the time because in my ma mind, I only know one way to do it, right? I need yeah. to build a whole bunch of drawers just like you. And I know there's, like, a million different ways of dr building drawers, but for some reason, I've said it to myself, they need to be uh, box joint drawers. I don't know why. They're for all my drawers are butt joints. Right, but they're for a closet. Like they're literally mm. for nothing important. It's for a closet. It's not fine furniture. They're right? also for but, yourself. Right, but that's why I want to do them really well. Yeah. See, I'm the opposite. I'm. I'm like, I don't care what it looks like. I just want it done. Like I, I just want it to function correctly. If it was like the way I'm building the drawers for my workbench and that, there is no way that I would send them out the door like that for a client. I. I hope. I hope not. So, <laughs> Grant, number one, I would say I think you should make them with box joints because I think that would be really fun and you'll get a lot of pride in it. Um, and number two, like that's one of the things I really love about the maker community is I feel like there's not a huge emphasis on like one way of doing anything, doing things. Mm. Whereas in other areas of the internet, I feel like people can get very dogmatic in terms of saying like, oh, well, if you're doing this, this is the way to do it. But it's like when, if you make a lot of different things, I think you start to realize pretty quickly that there's like a million ways to skin a cat and right. it's very empowering. Like it allows you to get out of your own way. Cause you're like, yeah, I can like, I can do it this way. I can do it this other way. I'm just going to do it the way that makes sense for me. I have never understood that analogy. Who the hell is going around skinning cats? Uh, Mark Twain. Oh, did he invent that saying? I, d I doubt he invented anything, no. but uh, he was, <laughs> uh, he, he was, I think one of the first to use it in a, in a, you know, 
way that people saw. But all that to say yeah. is, I think um, the 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 hundred ways to skin a cat, or however many it is, is just another way of like people were skinning cats for meat and stuff. Like if you think about it in terms of North America, we have large size cat cats. Um, I was, um, let's end I that anyway. now. I don't care anymore about your large <laughs> cats in yes. Canada. Okay. Quickly, quickly before we do move on, I don't think you should do box joints, Grant. I think you should do hand cut dovetails. It's mm. it's in plywood though, so that's not cool. Plywood dovetails. I I love the look of plywood when it's cut into different things like that. Yeah, I think it looks great yeah. as box joints. I don't think yeah. it looks great as a as a dovetail. I don't I know think if I've ever should. seen plywood dovetails. That could be. I think you should flip the table and make them. And that sounds really point. annoying to cut because I feel like the grain. I know that's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> it might look cool, but I feel like it would not be fun to make. <laughs> I might just do pocket screws. Like I don't know. Mm, we'll right. see. Why not just do butt joints then? But pocket just, screws are butt joints. I think you should just. No, hot, I think you should hot glue it together. Screw from the outside. Like all right. Okay. Um, Continuing before on. Before <laughs> we transition to our clamp mendations, I wanted to give a big shout out to everyone who supports us on Patreon. We support, we, it's not support, we appreciate all those people muchly. Um, everyone who supports us on Patreon gets access to the after show and the pre show if we do one, as well as a custom embossed leather keychain made by yours truly. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to patreon.com slash clamp also linked in the show notes as always. Um, yeah. On that, let us transition to clamp mendations. Clamp mendations. I watched a video today that was really cool. It was by Zyla Foxlin. Um, I followed her on Twitter for a little while, but I haven't actually seen one of her videos until today. And she launched a beauty pageant crown into space um, it was actually a very interesting story in the video. Um, she basically, uh, like in her, the course of starting like an engineering startup, she entered a uh, beauty pageants in Cleveland and in Ohio to sort of put the narrative to the test that they are now using them as a vehicle for um, for scholarships and in like empowering women in education. Um, so it was a very interesting like social commentary. And she, she, I think she, she, it was, I think I liked how transparent she was in terms of like, I had this like preconception about beauty pageants, but they are this sort of like gray area, very like complex thing that really helps a lot of people. Um, but I'm still going to shoot my crown that I won into space. Um, so she did it with like a weather balloon, did all this tracking with it. Um, it was just a really cool video. I haven't really watched a more like, science smarter everyday style uh video in a while and i i really want to check out more of her videos now she does really cool stuff mm -hmm. she definitely cool. does i loved the like i really wish that like when the the balloon exploded um it like basically knocked the the crown off so she doesn't have the crown so i really hope someone finds it and like I don't know, does something posts on social media. So we see it. It's probably in someone's field and they'll get like wrapped up in a, in a combine or something, but it would be really yeah. cool. If someone found it. Yeah. For show. Sure. Uh, Grant, what's in your client mandation this week? <laughs> Make some metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to put in everyone else's clamps. Um, I'm clamp mandating uh, Dean Duplantis. Um, he put out a, a video an Instagram post about his little, uh, he made like a, a tic-tac-toe game. It's his entry into the Because We Make Podcasts uh, uh, Unwrap a Project Challenge. But what I really liked about it is like his story behind why he made that, uh, like how he came up with it with his wife in this like little tic-tac-toe game where the, the board doesn't exist until you place the pieces. And I just thought that is such a great idea because tic-tac-toe is, is 
Like whoever goes first wins or ties. There's like whoever goes first wins or ties. There's no other way. You can't go second and win unless you're playing against a three year old. Like so by having the like you gotta check out the video, it explains it really well. The board moves around. Right? You decide where the board is based on where you place the X's and O's. And uh yeah, go check it out. It's really cool. Sounds really cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, mine this week is Zach Builds put out a tool stand. It's pretty much just a cabinet on wheels. But um, to hold his, I don't even know what they're called. It's like a thickness of it. It's a sander. Uh, drum, drum sander. S- drum, drum sander. So what's the what's the one that moves up and down like with a bed that's a drum? Isn't that a drum sander? Yeah. That's an o- a so- oscillating uh, drum sander. Okay. Anyway, (laughs) uh, it was just really cool to see how he built the cabinet because it had to hold so much weight. So like trying to get past that engineering feat of like, you can't just put butt butt joints together like I'm doing for my drawers because there's no way to hold that much weight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it was a good video. Hmm. All right. Um, Well, at this point, we would read a review of people reviewing our clamps and I would do it in a textbook accent of wherever they gave me. But unfortunately this week we do not have any reviews to read. Um, so if you want to hear that, uh, you can send us a review that you posted on whatever podcast player you listen to. Um, and I will read it in an accent of your choosing. Oh, and since we don't have a review new thing that we started that I almost forgot, um, what are any tips that you guys have? <laughs> Tool tip, material tip, well, workshop tip, life tip, life hack? Life, life hack. Anyone? You're the host. Go for it. Oh, am I supposed to come up with one? Hmm. Yeah. Wow. I was there's so no guest unprepared. to throw it to. Okay, actually, so this isn't a tip, but I want to do crowdsource a solution from you guys. So, Grant, you watched the um, the uh, insert video, the fireplace catnuck. Yes. So you know that part when I was struggling trying to nail it together because I couldn't clamp it with the with the bevel joint. So for the listeners, if you haven't seen the video, essentially, like I had a f- flat panel and I was gluing and nailing two side pieces to it to form a U but I couldn't clamp the side pieces directly to the back because they had a beveled front. And if I clamped it, I would crush the front. So like it was very awkward to do. And I'm curious, Grant, if you, if watching it, you were like, there's a much easier way to do that. Cause I feel like I didn't do it in the best way, but in the moment I was like, this is the only thing I can think of. So that's why, uh, like a miter joint or a bevel joint is like the, one of the, like weakest ones is because you really need to have four corners to do it. Right. I mean, this wasn't a joint. It was just like an aesthetic edge. Right. But that's what, why, because the whole clamping thing is that they, they pushed it, they, they pushed each other away. Right. So there wasn't really a, a better way to do it other than the nail gun, the nail gun. That's exactly what it's for. Yeah, it's so convenient for that, being able to just like hold things together. Um, it's like a clamp. But you know what's funny? To talk to, to reference back to our earlier discussion, I almost refuse to use mine because the air compressor is always out of juice. And if I had a battery-powered one, I would probably use my nail gun more often. But I absolutely hate pulling out the air gun and pull out the compressor, right? Like it's just like frustrating to me. Like you waiting should- a minute – you should make it like a dedicated spot for your compressor and like a hose on a reel. Like you'll definitely use it then. No, because I'll never turn it on because it's loud. And that, like, that's like the the best you can hope for is that it runs once a day because it will always run once a day. But that's like say if I had an extension cord on a reel, I would use it all the time with the corded tool. That's right. so. I was going to say it in the after show, but I'll say it now quickly that the other day, yesterday morning, I needed to quickly put a couple of strips of wood on where I stuffed up on my workbench and my bread nailer isn't working, but I have a corded one. 
And instead of getting the quarter one out, I literally got my hammer and l- tiny little pin nails and hammered <laughs> it on by hand because I could not be bothered to run an extension cord. No, totally. It's like why I used a coping saw the other day uh, doing the trim work was because I didn't want to take my jigsaw out because it's a corded yeah. jigsaw. Yeah. Right? And I was just like, you know what? It'll just be faster to use a handsaw. You know, but that's why multiple tools that do the same thing exist because sometimes you just want to get it done and you want a little bit of tool variety. Right. But if I was doing like 30 of them, I would pull out the jigsaw for sure. But if I'm doing two? Yeah. It's a coping saw. It's right? it's so funny. It's so funny how like we we will we will try to save time by doing something simply, but it ends up just taking more time because it's a worse way of doing it. Hmm. I I do that all the time. If I had just like taken the extra five minutes to get a nice setup, it would have just made it my life easier. When I think about that, I think about mechanic work and how often I have. Like instead of taking the two bolts to take the alternator off or something, it's like I work around the alternator and I like have my hands all twisted up, like ratcheting the wrench one click at a time, click, click, <laughs> click, right? And you're just like, or I could take two bolts off that are easily getting, like I could get to them with an impact driver, just bzz, bzz, right, pull the alternator out of the way, right? Yeah. Instead, I'm like click, click click and it's like it took you like 13 minutes to undo one bolt and the other way like if you can get everything out of the way uh, yeah. I've started just like I'm, I I one day I took the entire engine out of my car to do something oh my god do you have a once. winch yeah oh nice yeah I got it all got it all when it comes to car working on stuff that's awesome all right with that <laughs> um, before we head out I just want to give a big thanks to TF turning for the theme song uh, it has become an integral part of the show, and the fact that he made it for us is really cool. Um, if you want to see Grant's awesome cover arts, you can see them on Instagram at Clampcast. If you want to see tweets, you can see them at Twitter at the Clampcast. And if you want to see our beautiful faces talking while podcasting, you can find us on YouTube, and our channel name is Clamp. But you should probably search Clamp Morley Adam Grant. So the SEO works. <laughs> a, li- a little secret for the listeners. My baby was here for a few minutes. See so if you can sneaky. find him in the YouTube clip. Yeah. Comment with the timestamp. Yep. And, and we'll give you, you a hearty pat on the back. Yes. <laughs> I will give you a thumbs up in real time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See ya. See ya. Cheers.